Welcome to the Big Fellas Podcast, where we chop it up about all things past, present, and future about the game of basketball. Where facts, stats, and context reign supreme. That is blasphemous. Sometimes it gets crazy, but we always keep it real. Always keep it real. Get ready to learn from players, coaches, and fans from all levels of the game and see the court in a brand new way. And now, fresh off the sidelines, here's your host, John Hartofillis. What it do, fellas, and welcome to the Big Fellas Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, J.H., coming to you from New York City, the mecca of basketball. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Len Elmore, a New York basketball legend. I spoke with Len about what it was like playing both the NBA and ABA, broadcasting one of the greatest college basketball games of all time, and being a sports management professor at Columbia University. We've got a good one in store for you today, fellas. Episode number 46, Len Elmore, NBA player, broadcaster, professor. Hi, Len. How are you? Good, John. How are you doing? Great, having having a really good day. I hope you are as well. And I'm really looking forward to this one. Yeah, I am. I'm having a good day. It'll... Just to start off and give our listeners kind of a background on how you first got started. As a kid, what got you introduced to the game at first? Well, um, you know, I was more of a baseball player growing up in, in Brooklyn and the projects in East New York and then moving to Queens, you know, small a little house in, in, a, in a working class neighborhood in South Queens uh, where there were more open spaces. But when I went to junior high school in uh, Woodside, Queens, you know, I used to goof around with some of the kids, uh, my classmates. I was a little bit taller than most of them. And, um, you know, one of the things that they were doing was playing half-court basketball. And, you know, being tall, the ball would go up. I'd go with both hands. And I'd, I'd tell people, you know, I probably look like Chief in Cuckoo's Nest when I had the ball over my head and would move around. But um, I had a, a, a PE teacher who saw me, recognized that I had some athleticism based upon playing the other sports, baseball and some football, and asked if uh, I'd be interested in playing against people my size. Uh, of course, and that was uh, uh, kind of um, uh, taking advantage of my insecurity being taller than everyone else. So he took me to this high school in Manhattan, played full court. Little did I know it was uh, a tryout. So half court. I mean, at, at half court, they tossed the ball up, center jump. They tipped it and took off. I'm still standing there because I didn't know the rules. I didn't know. I'm curious. How do you guys know which way to run? Uh, and that was my my uh, baptism uh, in basketball. Now, of course, uh, again, with ath- athleticism, I was told what to do. Go get the ball off the rim. You know, don't let this guy score to try to, you know, put your hand up, block the shot. And I was able to do those things. And that's why my forte became more defense uh, and rebounding to a great extent. And, you know, I spent a couple of summers playing in the Rucker and other places where I could hone my skills, get embarrassed and ultimately learn from it. And eventually, by the time I was a junior, I started at Power as a sophomore. By the time I was a junior, I was all city. And, and by the time I was a senior, I was a high school All-American. It's crazy to think about the transformation you made while in high school and then in college and the pros, it took you to a whole other level. While you were in high school, playing at Power Memorial where, where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, formerly known as Lua Cinder, also went, obviously a great tradition of winning basketball there. What was kind of like that, that high school scene like back then in, in New York City when it was undoubtedly the mecca of basketball? Oh, it was highly competitive. There was no question about it. And one of the things that I enjoyed was the fact that prior to our Catholic school uh, athletic association, games, we got to scrimmage some of the public schools and we played DeWitt Clinton, we played Boys High, really got into the mix of, you know, great public school basketball as well, where a number of of the New York legends and stars were there. And, you know, you learn a lot from playing against those guys as well, different styles. But, you know, for the most part, we played uh, some of the tougher schools in in our division, obviously, and, and played them well. You know, my sophomore year was kind of a learning experience. My junior year, we were 19 and two, lost to Malloy in the finals. And my senior year, we were uh, high school national champions, uh, went undefeated, got a chance to avenge our loss to Malloy by beating them, you know, by about 25 in, in that uh, in that final game. But, you know, it was something, power had a tradition. And I, I didn't see myself as the next Luau Cinder, although a lot of people did. I, I always joke that, you know, the, when I got there as a sophomore, not having much basketball under my belt, they would write articles and say the second coming. And, and that all happened prior to the first day of practice. After the second day of practice, 
somebody said anything anymore. So, you know, I recognize that. But we had a terrific team. I had two other guys on my team who were outstanding uh, high school players, Ed Searcy and Japheth Trimble. Searcy particularly was a legend because he jumped so high. He, he named himself Apollo 11 after the astronauts. But but Eddie had, a, you know, a great reputation. Um, you know, Jack Trimble went with me to the University of Maryland. Searcy went to Duquesne and then transferred to St. John's. So a lot of people who know anything about New York basketball would recognize those names. Of course, and definitely such a rich history there in terms of New York basketball. Obviously, after a standout high school career, you were looking up playing college and, and you ended up going to Maryland. What was that college decision like for you? And obviously, you had a great career in Maryland. And I'm curious how that played out. The decision was, was relatively difficult because after my sophomore year, going into my junior year, the letters started to trickle in. But by the time I finished my junior year, it was an avalanche of, of offers. You know, some of them too good to be true, offers of money and prestige and jobs after I left. I mean, it, just about any under the table nonsense that you can think of, that's what I experienced from a lot of these coaches. But you know, staying on the, the straight and narrow with a lot of help from my parents to, to recognize, you know, the, the folly in, in many of those silly offers. I, you know, I, I kind of narrowed it down. I wanted to stay probably in the East, even though I was contacted by UCLA and, and in the South, certainly I was contacted by Carolina, Duke, Midwest, uh, some of the other schools. But once I made it official that I was going to stay in the East, I really wanted to go to St. John's, which was only a half half hour away from my house in Queens. But Coach Carnesecca left after my junior year in, in high school. He went to uh, the New York Nets and the ABA to coach them. Uh, and that's when Maryland swooped in with uh, Lefty Drizel and George Raveling, who became a pretty good college coach unto himself, uh, coaching at uh, Iowa, Washington State, Iowa, and then uh, Southern Cal before going on to be a, a big wig at Nike. But uh, I got a letter from them just about every day. You know, the type of attention they gave you was, was tremendous. And I wanted to go to a place where, you know, I could have some impact historically, where, you know, my name would be remembered as kind of reviving the schools, the basketball fortunes. And Maryland was perfect for that because they had never really experienced a great deal of, of, of success. And um, so when I made the decision to go there, I also remind people that I was a, a Catholic school, all boys Catholic school student. And when I went to that idyllic campus between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., uh, so I could be close to some big cities, I also told myself, I'm going to take a look at the first 10 young women on campus. And if the majority were good looking, I'm going. So, you know, that's, that's a boy going to a boys school. <laughs> but, you know, that combination of all those things really had, had a great impact on my decision making. And, you know, I... My mother wanted me to go to Princeton, which I would have gone to, but, uh, you know, I had seen ACC basketball in the game of the week in New York because of so many New York guys going down south, particularly to South Carolina. So I, I was, I had somewhat of an affinity for the ACC. Of course, and definitely so interesting to think about all that great stuff you had witnessed when you were there. And then being obviously one, one of Maryland's all-time leading rebounders, definitely with a historic impact on that school as a whole. And definitely be remembered there for generations to come as someone that really did change basketball for that for that school after graduating from there obviously though you, you had a stellar college career we're looking to play professionally what was that whole would that seem like with the NBA and ABA they, they were about to merge but hadn't merged yet and and your decision in, in going pro well I mean one of the things that I was making sure of having heard the rumors that there was going to be a potential merger and it might have happened prior to me getting there but certainly it could happen after I got there um, you know the Indiana Pacers uh, kind of traded for my rights as first round pick in the ABA and you know my agent and I did some research as far as their um, solvency as, as an organization you know would they be one of the teams that would survive a merger or not and, and we felt that they would be um, I was also drafted by the Washington Bullets uh, now the Wizards in the NBA in fact you know people think of the draft now at the pomp and circumstance all the pageantry of being uh, in Madison Square Garden or in Chicago and being on television and guys and, and, you know, waiting in that little green room area to be introduced and come up and shake hands with the commissioner. Well, that didn't happen during our days. Um, I happened to be visiting my girlfriend, who was my wife, over in uh, the south of France, and we're in a bed at breakfast, and it's three o'clock in the morning, and I get an irate 
um, uh, inn owner, innkeeper knocking on my door in French saying, you got a telephone call and you woke up the whole family. And the telephone call was that uh, I was drafted by the Washington Bullets. But we made the decision based on the offer, which the Bullets came in you know, relatively low and cheap, which is what the NBA did at the time. They offered me a three-year contract, two of them guaranteed, but the Pacers offered five years guaranteed and, you know, for more money. And so obviously uh, recognizing their solvency and the ability to pay, I, I decided I was going to go to the ABA, knowing that we'd ultimately be, uh, be merged into the NBA. And it was, uh, you know, it was probably a, 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 obviously a good decision. Because with the three-year deal, only two guaranteed. And my third year as a pro, coming off a season where I averaged almost 15 and 11, I wound up hitting something and wrecking my knee. You know, that third year, I missed just about all of the season except for about six games. And, you know, I never was quite the same for a long period of time. Had I taken the Bullets offer, I might not have played any further than three years in, in basketball. Definitely a, a great decision on your on your part, and both in hindsight and at the time, with knowing that making a, a good decision based on, on the totality of your career and not just going straight to the NBA, but realizing that this ABA team will at some point make it to the NBA and and, and really playing your cards right in that respect. Being in the ABA is, is interesting because for some for someone my age, unless you really really re read up on it, you really won't know a lot of these details that you're sharing with us. So thank you so much for for sharing that insight on the ABA. And I actually wanted to bring up, I was looking it up to prepare for this interview. And I, was just, I saw some pictures of you. One of them was really interesting because you were setting up for a charge and Dr. J was was going up <laughs> for, for, for a finger lip. I'm sure you've seen the picture before. Oh yeah, um, I have it. <laughs> so what was, the, what, was the, what was the decision like in that moment to, to square up and take a charge on one of the highest flyers in league history? Well, I mean, I was in position to do it. And, yep. you know, I, I darn sure wasn't going to block that shot. So you might as well put your body on the line. I'm not sure what happened. He probably got the call. You know how it is. Yeah. Superstars yeah. get the call. But, um, you yeah, know, there are a, a number of great players. Obviously, I played with, you know, one of the, the best ABA players and, and really an NBA player who a lot of people don't talk about. But, you know, I was so happy that several years ago he made it to the Naismith Hall of Fame. And that's George McGinnis, who I tell everyone, George McGinnis was LeBron before LeBron uh, with regard to body, speed, strength you know, touch, all of those different things, the ability to make plays off the bounce, um, you know, find people. Uh, he could post you, he could shoot the three. Uh, George was outstanding. And, and, you know, there are other great players, uh, not just Julius, George Gurman, uh, Moses Malone, people like that. Uh, Maurice Lucas was playing in the league for a while. Um, you could just, Artis Gilmore was one of my nemeses. We played against each other a lot. Uh, me as an undersized center trying to guard him was difficult, although, you know, I had my moments. Um, you know, just so many great players, and fortunately, the merger came and we were able to, you know, kind of gain our due, uh, those guys particularly, as people got a better chance to see them as NBA players. Oh, for sure. Definitely. The, the merge changed a lot. And it, my follow-up question to the first one about the charge was, was it a charge or a block? What do you think? I Did I have position? I think you were, you were, you were set for a while. He was pretty far away from you when that picture was taken. There's, there's some yeah. space in between. So I feel like it's gotta be a charge. I mean, definitely I, got there there be, I got there before he took off. I'm pretty sure of that. Well before. <laughs> definitely. I mean, we might have to see another, if there is any other pictures of different angles or obviously a video would help a lot. Definitely have to, uh, have to do, some, have to do some, some very good digging to find that. I'll send it, I'll send it to you after we get off, but definitely you've played with some, some great teammates and, and George McGinnis is someone that really doesn't get mentioned at all when it comes to all time discussions, but you always, whether you're you're really digging it like let's say bill simmons is hall of fame pyramid I, mm -hmm. I read that book over the summer wrote a bunch of pages on george McGinnis. i'm like wow this guy like you really don't hear about this guy on any he's not on any other lists you really need those bigger lists to, to see that and say wow well if you really look into the but you can make a case for him to be a lot higher on, on a lot of these lists and especially when you watch footage of him and you, and you see the way he played definitely yeah. a, a very good player well the, any anybody who really uh celebrates themselves as aficionados of the game would recognize uh, the impact of George McGinnis and, you know, his impact on the game itself. You know, like I said, I was happy that he made it to the Naismith Hall of Fame, which was very fitting for the things that he was, uh, he was capable of doing. Obviously, well, once your playing career was over, you've transitioned into this into this very long and successful career, whether it's teaching at Columbia or your work as a lawyer. Once you retired, were you interested in law kind of while you were playing in, in college or was it something that kind of really sparked an interest later on? Actually, I, I had wanted to be a lawyer since I was a kid. Growing up, uh, I 
watched a lot of TV when I wasn't playing sports or I wasn't going to school. And, you know, I was very moved by the lawyer shows, Perry Mason, the Defenders and others who, you know, were the voice for the voiceless, uh, gave power to the powerless. And at that time, the civil rights uh, movement was was in full swing. Um, the war in Vietnam, the, the protests against it uh, were occurring. And, you know, just overall change was, was in the offing. And, and I thought that law was a, a terrific vehicle where you could get involved in that change for good. You know, I kept that with me throughout the whole time. One of the reasons I went to Maryland is because uh, I was given um, advice by, at that time, Senator Joseph Tidings, the late Senator Joseph Tidings, about you know, what he pursued before he went to law school. He was an English major, which I was, and, you know, developed great writing skills and otherwise communicative skills. And, and that's something that, you know, I had always been interested in. Plus, I had a, a hero that after reading books about him, you know, I, I wanted to kind of emulate his life. And that was Paul Robeson, who not only was a great athlete, but, you know, he was a human rights and, and civil rights advocate. He was a all-American football player, played baseball in the Negro Leagues. You know, he was a, a lawyer, graduated from Columbia Law School. He also was a, a, a classical singer, an actor, uh, and as I said, an advocate for human rights and civil rights. And so he was kind of a Renaissance man. And, you know, that really, uh, I was really attracted to, to people like that. And I thought to myself, he can do anything he wanted to. And that's kind of what I said to myself. So I could tell towards the end of my ninth year in the game that my knees were hurting. I didn't have much more time, even though I'd signed a two-year contract with the Knicks. So that summer, you know, I did my research and took the, um, took the LSATs, the the SAT for, for law school. I, I assume I did pre reasonably well. And then I filled out applications. Uh, you know, I was accepted pretty quickly to Maryland and applied to Georgetown and some other schools. And my girlfriend, who is now my wife, challenged me and said, why don't you, why don't you go for the best? Why don't you uh, fill out a, a, a form, a, an application for Harvard? And I looked at her and said, you're kidding. I'm not getting in there. Um, but I did it anyway, kind of as a dare. And uh, here it is coming into my 10th year um, playing, we're playing the Celtics. I'm a Nick, and we're playing the Celtics in Boston in the playoffs. And I get the letter of acceptance. So I decide to go, you know, on an off day to go over to Cambridge um, and walk around, look at the library, look at uh, the common area, the so called student union, and just get a feel for what life was like. Go sit and have a cup of coffee in Harvard Square. And I told myself, okay, this is where you're going to be next year. Um, you know, having been a little bit frustrated with the end of my career. And as I said, I had another year left in my Nick career, but I just thought it's time to get started. And so uh, that's when I embarked on uh, the pursuit of uh, legal education. That's fantastic. And, and my, my father's around the same age as you and, and lived through a lot of those experiences. And always, whenever I, we talk about his decision to, to go into law, he always brings up a lot of the similar things that you did. And, and it's interesting for me being so, so young to think about how different the world was back then and kind of the environment that, that he graduated college in compared to the one I'm, I'm about to graduate into right now. Definitely super interesting to kind of think about those points. And then when you brought up some of your mentors that kind of helped you in that pursuit of, of the legal field, it also proposes the question that I, I just thought of, of what other mentors did you have? I mean, maybe not just basketball, but obviously whether it's, if there were other legal mentors, if there were other just mentors in life with, with, with your parents, just who kind of was that for you to kind of show you the way to, to be the best version of yourself? Well, I, I would say it all began to, began with my parents. You know, my mother uh, was from a little poor town in Louisiana, but you know, she was uh, she was a bright woman. She was second in her class in her high school class. Had actually gotten a scholarship to an HBCU, a Southern University, but she couldn't accept it because the family was so poor. She uh, migrated to New York to be with my aunt, her sister, to clean buildings you know, to be a part of a cleaning crew for buildings to be able to send money back home to Louisiana. My father uh, left school in the 10th grade, ultimately joined the army, was uh, a World War II uh, veteran, um, was over in Japan during the, with the occupation forces, you know, saw a little bit of action. But in the end, both of them recognized that um, you didn't go in nowhere without some semblance of education, uh, since both of them had missed out on it. And so when 
both of my parents uh, wound up getting city jobs in New York City. My father became a sanitation man and my mother a clerk. And both of them passed civil service tests. They made sure in that little house that we had that my siblings and I, I had a place where we could do our homework. They called it the library, but it was just a little corner of the basement that my father finished uh, by hand. It had a shelf, you know, some bookshelves and a, and a um, kind of a countertop that we could use as a desk. And as I said, we called it the library. We had a set of encyclopedias that my family went into debt to get, as well as a, 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 a collection of Bible stories. That was the beginning. And we kind of populated those shelves with other books as time went on. Uh, so they were extremely important, emphasizing the, the strength and, and the need for education. Then I think my high school coach, Jack Cunert, the late Jack Cunert, he and I spent a lot of time together because at Power, you know, we would play games at 7 p.m. I lived in Queens, which was an hour and a half. So after school, I couldn't go home. So I stayed at the school, you know, went out, had a bite, but would spend time with Coach, who lived in New Jersey. So he had to stick around as well. And we had some great talks about life, about uh, society, particularly during those tumultuous times in the, in the mid 60s, late 60s, you know, 67, 68, particularly, which you know, 68 is reminiscent of today with uh, the social upheaval. So he, he, had a, he had a profound impact on me as well. And, you know, I would go forward, George Raveling, the assistant coach at Maryland, um, taught me an awful lot about discipline, also a lot about rebounding. He was a pretty good rebounder himself at Villanova. And for the couple of years that I spent with him, I learned. Um, you know, I, I could name a lot of people going forward, but uh, those are the people who had the initial impact on me. And then, of course, reading. Um, as, a, as a young man, I recognize the importance of, of staying true to your discipline, to, you know, be an activist for social justice, to stand for what was right. Uh, after I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and, and saw his transformational change. And, um, you know, as a young Black man during that time, that was kind of a, a rite of passage to read that book and understand who you are and the role that you play. So as you can tell, John, there was an awful lot <laughs> that, that had influence on me during those times. Um, and, and I carry them to, to, to this day, uh, recognizing that I'm so much of, of, of those people and, and those readings. I found it especially interesting when you spoke about what you call the library, which was a little corner in, in your in your basement that your parents, your, that your father built by hand. Uh, it got me thinking about how that that just further made you into the man you are today in terms of instilling that that skill of hard work into you. And then you now have the opportunity now to pass that on to, to students now when you're teaching at Columbia. So what's kind of that role been like for you? And now you're the mentor passing that information along and and, and those teachings along to students today. Well, I, I've enjoyed it greatly, and I've been very fortunate to have students who uh, really had a thirst for learning. And the way I got to Columbia was, um, you know, I'm kind of in between in between projects, if you will. I mean, I, I when I began, once I got out of law school, I was a prosecutor in Kings County, New York, an assistant district attorney. I spent almost four years there, you know, developing trial skills and, and learning the law. And you know, ultimately, I got an opportunity during that period of time to do television. Uh, so I kind of balanced two careers, announcing as well as uh, the legal profession. And, you know, kind of went from public interest, like uh, the working for the government to private practice, but all the while still doing television. I, I got a point, got to a point where I thought I could do more. And so I wanted to help other athletes. And uh, in 1992, immediately after the Duke Kentucky game, which Vern Lundquist and I called, I decided I was going to step out and become an agent and try to help the so many guys whose stories I heard where they were defrauded, otherwise aimless. And for about five years, I was an agent. We were successful, seven first round picks, NBA picks, a number of uh, top football picks, some Olympic athletes. But, you know, the business of being an agent got to the point where it if I was going to continue to be successful, I'd have to do things that would threaten my reputation um, and even my law license. Uh, as we know, that's the, that's the problem with agents today in competition to get, to get clients. And so I decided to step away from that, went back to law as well as ultimately, um, you know, regaining my ability to do television. And so for 31 years, I was a TV announcer as well as an attorney. And so the reason I say that, because in between that, I ran a couple of companies, an uh, education technology company. 
I was also the CEO of iHoops, which was a joint venture of the NBA and the NCAA, uh, trying to clean up youth basketball and, and establish a new paradigm there. But, you know, that didn't work very well because Dr. Miles Brand, who was the president of the NCAA at the time, and this was his idea, he passed away. The NBA didn't seem nearly as interested in doing the right thing uh, by this organization, and I wound up leaving. But all that to say that by the time I got to the idea of Columbia, um, I had thought to myself, you know, I've amassed all of this institutional knowledge uh, in so many different areas, uh, whether it's in leadership and in, in the business area, certainly in sports, you know, what am I going to do with it? I'm, uh, I quite honestly, I was 65 years old at the time. And, you know, I said, I could retire, go sit back in the, on my porch and, you know, watch the birdies fly and the sun come up. But uh, I decided, you know, there's more to do and I've got this institutional knowledge. So I'm not going to be able to take it with me. So let me give it away. And, um, you know, the thing that piqued my interest was athlete activism, uh, seeing athletes step up, particularly Colin Kaepernick and, and try to, to uh, you know, do the right thing, recognize that responsibility that, that he thought that he had, he believed that he had. And so with all of that, you know, made my pitch to Columbia and, um, it was accepted and that's what I do right now. I teach a number of courses that include athlete activism for social justice as well as leadership. So that's kind of the long way around to you know how I got to it. But as I said, I'm extremely fortunate that in the Columbia Sports Management Program, I've got a lot of uh, intelligent students who thirst for knowledge, don't mind working and uh, it's been a pleasure. Great knowledge going through there in Colombia, and it, your broadcast career is super interesting, especially when considering. I mean, that Christian Lander shot is one of the most famous shots of all time. I mean, do you kind of remember what your call was for that, or? Um, well, it wasn't necessarily my call since I was a, the color analyst. I, I know that we did analyze uh, the fact that there are a couple of guys there between Leitner and Jamal Mashburn for Kentucky, who would kind of define uh, power forward play, the prototype, the ability to step outside and shoot and put it on the floor, particularly the athleticism of Jamal Mashburn. And both of them put on a show. We also talked about the decision that coaches make. The most critical decision out there was Rick Pitino not putting a man on the ball, trying to bother uh, the view of the passer who happened to be Grant Hill. Without a man on the ball, Grant Hill was able to throw the ball perfectly uh, from the baseline to the other free throw line where Leitner caught it, was able to turn and face and, and knock down the shot, had plenty of time. Uh, the other thing that we looked at was the fact that when the ball's in the air for that long, you know, players need to go after the ball. You, when the ball's in the air, you're entitled to the ball as much as the offensive player. So the defense just stood there and watched Leitner catch it. I'm sure a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, they were, um, they were admonished in, in the huddle prior to coming out that don't foul, don't foul. But that kind of freezes a, a defender. And John Pelfrey, who is an assistant coach now for somebody in, on the college level, he just stood there and watched Leighton catch the ball and didn't even really contest the shot with fear of fouling. I, I don't think that um, if they had played in my time, I don't think that pass would have been made because we either would have put a seven footer on the passer or when the ball's in the air, I was going to get it. Uh, remember my football days. So, but, but those are the things that I felt were really interesting throughout that game, the pacing, the play, uh, particularly late in his play, he was perfect from the field, perfect from the free throw line and then hits the, the winning shot. Uh, you know, the, the suddenness of it all, I think is what made it such a great game. Rick Pitino in Kentucky could have definitely used you uh, lacing up that night, <laughs> would have helped them, or, or, or on the sideline maybe with them instead, instead of commentating to have been right next to him and whispering his ear, hey, maybe you should put a big on the, on the, on the ball. That might have been. Uh, yeah, I would have been all over, Coach. He might not have listened to me, but I would have told him. Ironically, Rick Pitino, you know, he, he was assistant coach with the Knicks when I played, so, so we obviously had a history. And in my mind, I was thinking, Rick, you should have known better. <laughs> That's funny. Rick, Rick, you played, you played, you, you, you knew what the game was like back then. You would have put a guy in the ball or hat or played a little bit more physical. Oh, no question. There's no question about that. The physical play, certainly the ball's in the air, you go get it. And just to wrap up, I was curious because you've obviously experienced so much over the years in the basketball world, in the academics with Columbia, all, all of that amazing stuff. But what's some advice now that you've had all these experiences that you would give back to a 20 year old Len Elmore and kind of help him on his journey to make it a laser for him? What's some advice you'd give him? I would say um, with regard to career, go with your passion but you can't develop your passion unless you've experienced enough things to find out what it is that you're really good at and what it is that you really love so 
you know, don't turn down opportunities unless, you know, there's just something that you don't want to do. If, if you're interested in it and there is an opportunity to fulfill it, to go for it. I think, again, in the long run, I, uh, I you know, I'm doing well financially, but I think my riches, if you will, have come from the experiences that I've had. You know, I'm a, you know, an older guy now and, and I can look back on all of those things. And I don't think there are a lot of people who have had literally the same opportunities to experience the things that I've had to be able to give back in, in many ways, the way that I have. And that's the other thing to recognize that, you know, you have been given, uh, if you have been given a great opportunities to do a lot of things and it's incumbent upon you to to be able to give back, you know, kind of uh, continue that, uh, that circle of, of karma. And that's another area where I've been rewarded so much uh, emotionally uh, and spiritually uh, by being able to give back and help people. And in turn, you know, I've been able to get an awful lot of help. Uh, so, you know, those areas, I think, are extremely important. You notice I didn't talk about anything material or anything like that. Those things will come. Of course, it's so important to keep that all in perspective and realize that as great as the experiences have been, what also I would imagine makes you feel makes you feel great looking back is knowing that you provided similar experiences like that for the people around you and other people and those you those you care about your family and all that you were able to provide them with valuable experiences and been blessed and you know that's that's part of the karma continuum. Oh, of course, and and Len, thank you so much for coming on today. I mean, I learned so much from you and and, and your your wisdom and your experiences both in the league, in academics, and in, in in all walks of life. And and I really appreciate you taking the time. And can't wait to talk again soon. Hey, John, pleasure is mine. Good luck to you. Thanks for listening to the Big Fellas Podcast. Check us out on all major social media platforms at Big Fellas Pod to join the chop up. You can also listen to us on every podcast platform on the planet. Stay tuned for the next episode, Big Fellas.